Good evening and welcome to Set Free. Set Free is a ministry that is specifically designed for anyone who may be experiencing any type of challenges with mental health and or addictions. What you can expect from us here this evening is approximately a 30 minute message that's based upon scriptural truths that will be applicable for what it is you are experiencing. Our desire for you is that you experience hope, encouragement, love, and prayer while you're tuned in with us with the ultimate desire that you will then partner with us on a journey that you will then embark upon in order to experience ultimate freedom in Christ. But tonight we have a very, very special speaker with us. We have Carlos Whitaker. Carlos is the author of the well-known book called Killing the Spider. And tonight he is going to be sharing with you his story of his rise to success, his fall into the depths of sin, which ultimately then led to his life of restoration and reconciliation with God, where he experienced divine healing. So if you would please welcome up with me, Carlos Whitaker. My name is Carlos Enrique Whitaker Guzman Chibolcabel, or you can call me Los for short. And I'm so excited to be afforded the opportunity to speak for just a few minutes about something that I honestly believe if you give me these next 25, 30 minutes and you apply these principles that we're going to be discussing, uh, this isn't something that I think you've got to work on for 15 years to pull off. I believe if you just apply these few principles today, your life can look drastically different after you apply these principles. But we're not just talking about like live your best life now or like Oprah-isms. All that stuff's great. What we're going to be talking about today and the next few weeks can change everything completely. You know what's so incredible about this time and this season that we're in is, and when I say incredible, this could be incredible in a good way or a bad way, but I know so many of my friends, myself included, feel like Holy Spirit has taken a flashlight and a magnifying glass and really zoning into areas of our lives that we can really give back to Him. Areas of our lives that maybe didn't bother us as much when we were in the hustle and the grind of our day to day, but now suddenly they're like glaring sores in our lives. And we're going to be diving into that. But before we hop into maybe some of the things in our lives we can get past, um, I want to talk to those of you that things are going pretty good. You know, um, not every season of life is a bad season. Um, there's lots of people that are watching this right now that are thinking, you know what? Coronavirus hasn't affected my family. Uh, I still got my income. Not only have, got, have I got my income, but sales are actually through the roof because I don't know, maybe you're doing something uh, that people really need right now. Or maybe you're in a season of life where like your marriage is fantastic and things are good. I wanna talk to you guys for a second where things are good. You know, I happen to be in one of those seasons of life where everything was not only good, but incredible just a few years ago. That was about seven years ago and it happened to be that every single business decision I made, every single thing I touched, ding, would turn to gold. Now I didn't make that sound effect, but you know what I'm saying? Like I, I could make no mistakes. Even mistakes that I was making would somehow morph into gold. It was such a sweet time of blessing, sweet time of anointing. And I want to talk to you guys for a second where things are good. I mean, I mean, things were so good. I even have video evidence of me making a mistake and it turning into gold. Let, let me explain for you guys. My kids and myself, and my wife, we were in downtown Atlanta. We were driving to a Braves game. And on the way to the Braves game, that Beyonce song, All the Single Ladies, came on. You guys know that song, All the Single Ladies? Oh, that one. Okay. So don't act like you don't know that song at GT Church. I know you guys know that song. So you got it in your head. Comes on the radio. My kids are in the backseat of the car. They start singing, All the Single Ladies, All the Single Ladies. And I think, this is cool. So I, I pulled my phone out and I started recording my three kids. Well, my son, who was about two years old at the time, was also singing all the single ladies. And I thought it would be funny to tell him that he, in fact, was not a single lady. Little did I know the devastation that would incur inside of his ethos when this happened. Well, well, here's the deal. Since I was recording, it was so funny. I was going to send it to my mom in L.A. That was the whole point of the video. But my wife thought, you know, that video is so funny. I think maybe you should upload it to that brand new website back then called YouTube. So I uploaded it to YouTube, and let me show you how a mistake of making my son cry in this season of abundance and blessing in my life turned to gold. 24 hours later, this is what happened. 
Watch this. The Whitaker family of Atlanta was in the car just singing along to Beyonce's hit song, Single Ladies. And then the family fun took an unexpected turn. Masai, you're not a single lady, buddy. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. You're a single lady. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I was just kidding. I was just kidding. You can do it. You can do it. Buddy, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, buddy. You're a single lady, okay? Okay? Here we go. If you like it, then you got a better ring on it. If you like it, you can't. Sorry. Did that hurt your feelings? I'm a horrible father, he says no. The video has gone viral, become a YouTube sensation, and joining... I'd woken up the next morning, and I was getting phone calls from every producer of every TV, TV show. We were on Good Morning America. We were on The Today Show. We were on Anderson Cooper. We were on Fox and Friends. We were on all the late night shows. We were on all the shows because they wanted to talk to the horrible father, Carlos Whitaker, that made his son cry. Friends, I'm telling you, like... This is how it turned to gold. Two weeks after that video went viral, 7.1 million people saw it. My very first worship record with Integrity Music came out. And I'll be honest with you, it was like a C plus or B minus, if I'm giving myself some grace, of a worship record. But because I made my son cry and 7.1 million people saw it, guess what? My record went number one. I was number one on every iTunes chart in the world, not just America, in Brazil, in Haiti, in, in all over the place, Argentina, in South. I mean, I was the number one record. See, even my mistake in that season turned to gold. Even more than that, a few months after that, my family got picked up in a limousine in our house in Atlanta, driven to Hartsfield Airport, flown to Los Angeles, picked up in another limousine, got driven to the Staples Center, walked down a red carpet, and on national television, Queen Latifah herself handed me a Crystal People's Choice Award for Viral Video of the Year. I won a trophy for making my son cry. That is how good it was. I'm telling you, life was so good. And, and, and here, the reason why I wanna to talk to you guys where life's so good for a second, is there's a danger, right? There's always a danger, and we're gonna turn it right now. Er, here's the danger. The warning and the danger for those of you where things are good is this. Scripture, when I open up the Bible, does not say every good and perfect gift comes from your hustle. It's not what it says, right? It actually says every good and perfect gift comes from where? comes from above. But you see, why I say that's dangerous is we start to convince ourselves that we are somehow the ones responsible for the blessing in our life. And when you convince yourself that you are somehow responsible for the blessing in your life, guess what? You are now taking the place of God in your life. And that is when it gets dangerous. Because then we start believing we can have our cake and eat it too. I'll never forget just just a few months after we won that People's Choice Award, just a few months after my family went viral, I, I, I was sitting in, I remember looking over at sin. And you know, you, if you're standing in light and you're in the abundance and the light of God's goodness, to be honest, when you look into darkness and you look to sin, there's something appetizing about that. If somebody is, would ever tell you that sin is not appetizing, you need to run from that person because they're lying. It is. And so I'll never forget looking at sin and thinking, I wonder if I can have some of that too. And I'll never forget the day that I decided to dip my toe into sin because look, God's been blessing me over here. I wonder if I can have some of that too. Guess what? Nobody found out. Life was awesome. It continued on. Then a few weeks later, I was like, I wonder if I can try that again. I dipped my toe a little bit longer. Maybe I stood over in darkness a little bit more. Nobody found out. Hop back over in the light. Next thing you know, it became a daily habit to start dancing between dark and light. And you guys know, if you've ever been in secret sin, you cannot mock God and you cannot dance.
between light and dark. One day, you'll move from dancing to drowning. And I'll never forget the day I started to drown. I was uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. We'd moved, recently moved there. Me and my three kids were in the back of the condo, and we were playing some game back there. And I remember I started to smell dinner was cooking, and I ran to the um, kitchen to ask my wife what was cooking. I mean, what, what dinner was. It smelled amazing. And she wasn't in the kitchen, but the burner was on, and the pot was still on the stove, and I, I thought that was weird. Heather, where are you, babe? She wasn't in the back. We lived in a small condo. I'd already gone in every room. She wasn't there. And then I remember turning to see where my laptop was. And my laptop was gone, and so was my wife. I sprinted out to the driveway. The minivan was gone, and I knew that I was no longer dancing. I was drowning. I ran back to the back of the condo. I picked up my kids and put them on the sofa, and with tears in my eyes, I said, hey, listen, Daddy, Daddy's made a big mistake, and I need you to forgive me. I don't know what's about to happen. And they were so confused because they saw me crying and we were just playing and they were like, what's wrong? And they were really little. They were only a few, maybe a year older than you saw in that video. Before I could finish my apology speech to my kids, there was a knock on my front door and it was my best friend, Blake. And he looked at me with pity in his eyes and he said, Heather knows everything. Your secret's out. She wants the kids and she wants you out. And so began the darkest season of my life. A season where I shook my fist at God every single night, asking, God, why didn't you give me the strength to get over my sin? I I tried. Trust me, I tried. I didn't want to destroy my family. And so I was angry at God. But listen, in the depths of my despair, I was begging my wife to come back. The marriage was over. Months passed. And as months passed, I realized that my desperate pleas to fix our marriage weren't gonna fix it. So I'll never forget, I was in my room and uh, really about to give up on everything. I had moved in with my friend Blake and his family. I moved out of my house. I hadn't seen my wife or spoken to her in months. And um, I got a text message from a friend and I picked it up and it was just, there was one scripture on that text message. And this is the first moment I hope that I felt this entire journey. Scripture said this, 1 Peter 5.10. Now the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will personally restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. Now, it didn't stop there. You know, if there was a period after support you, that would be the greatest scripture in the Bible, right? Who doesn't want all those things from God? But the scripture goes on and it says, after you have suffered a little. So yes, there's promises for restoration, establishment, strengthening, supporting. But there's also a promise we're going to suffer. But there's also a promise that that suffering won't last forever. So if you're in a season of suffering right now, I want you to lean into the next few minutes because I believe God is ready to yank you out of that suffering right now. Well, when I read that, everything shifted. I said, okay, God, I'm not shaking my fist at you. I'm going to, I'm going to give this one more shot. I may have lost my marriage, but I'm not going to lose my soul. So I began to pour into the word. Things began to shift inside of me. I started to strength to see the strengthening inside of my spirit. And my friends started to notice. And then another friend would notice. They're like, Carlos, things are shifting in you. I know you've lost your family and everything in your career, but this is amazing to see. And I'll never forget the day that my phone buzzed. Bzz, bzz. And I looked down, and after months of not hearing from my wife, there was her name on my phone, Heather. And it just said, coffee? Question mark. And I said, yes, exclamation point. And we met for coffee. And she looked at me and she said, is what I hear about you true? I said, I'm, I, I'm not going to say anything. You can just watch. And friends, let me tell you, she watched from a distance. Then she watched from this distance. Then this distance. Then this distance. And after a few months of watching, the God of all grace, who called me to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, personally restored established, strengthened, and supported my marriage. And that family that I lost, they're upstairs as I record this video right now because God will bring beauty from ashes. Now, was it overnight? Absolutely not. There was a lot of work. There's a lot of therapy. We, we were going to therapy, marriage counseling for years after that trauma happened. And even after the marriage counseling was over, my therapist was like, hey, yo, I know that marriage counseling's over, but you need to keep coming to therapy. And after a few years, I got like 80% better 
right? I got like 80% over my sin issue, right? There was a lot of striving, but there, there was some prayer as well. And I walked in and I was like, Al, Al's the name of my therapist. I need you to remember or think of the one guy you know named Al. That's exactly what my therapist looked like. You got that in your head? This is what I said to Al. Al, how much longer am I going to have to come in here every other week and paying you money? Am I almost fixed? He said, you're almost fixed. You just got to fix one thing. I said, what is that? He said, you have to figure out why you keep rubbing crap on your blessings. Excuse me? That's what my Christian therapist Al said. So I remember being offended, but I left right away and I, I went to the minivan and I called my dad. And the reason I called my dad, he's the wisest man I know. And I said, Dad, Al just told me that I rub crap on my blessings. I need you to tell me why. He said, Carlitos, let me tell you why you rub crap on your blessings. Now, I need you to know something about my dad. My father is a first generation immigrant from Colón, Panama. He immigrated to the United States in 1952 with $20 cash and a shoe shine kit. And he made, he's now Dr. Fermin Agustin Whitaker. Like the man is a saint. That's why I called him because he's so wise. I need you to see a picture of my dad before. Here, this is actually a picture of my dad. You see him right now. He's just at his time here in Hawaii, living his best life, immigrant life now. It's amazing. But I also know some of you are wondering, I've seen that man somewhere before. And you're actually right. Because this is also a picture of my dad. My dad is the emoji on your phone. Now, I, I sell that joke at my dad's expense every time I give this talk because we've been talking heavy. We needed to laugh for just a second, okay? I don't even text my dad I love you anymore. I just send him that emoji 100 times a day. This is what he said. Carlos, let me tell you a story. I was like, Dad, I ain't got time for one of your stories. He said, let me tell you a story. When I was in Panama preaching my very first revival, I gave the invitation, and Miss Ramirez was the only lady that came to the front. Very old lady. She walks to the front, and she asks me, Pastor, can you please pray for me? My dad says, sure, I'll pray for you. Can you please pray that God will clean the cobwebs from my life? So my dad said, he, that's very poetic. So he prayed, Lord, clean the cobwebs from Miss Ramirez's life. He says, Carlitos, night numero dos, Miss Ramirez came to the front for a prayer again. And she asked, Pastor, can you pray again that God would clean the cobwebs from my life, but can you pray harder? That's like, okay, I'll pray a little harder. So he prayed a little harder, put a little salt and pepper on his prayer. He said, clean the cobwebs from her life, God. He said, Carlitos, night numero tres, Miss Ramirez comes back to the front. She's crying still. She asked me one more time, can you please pray God could clean the cobwebs from my life? And I said, no, we have been praying the wrong prayer. Tonight, we do not pray. He cleans the cobwebs. Tonight, we pray. He kills the spider. Friends, I knew exactly in that moment why he told me that story. I was a professional cobweb cleaner. I spent my entire life cleaning the cobwebs. And I knew I keep, couldn't keep going to see Al and cleaning the cobwebs. I had to find the root and kill it. And here's the beautiful thing. I kept going to Al. And I identified my spider. I located my spider. I cornered my spider. I even killed the spider. But as much as I believe in therapy, I need you guys to know this. You cannot kill your spider in a therapist chair. The only way you can kill your spider is with the blood of the cross and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the only way. There, there's no life hacks to killing the spider. There's no shortcuts. You've got to use the power of the cross. And so for just a few more minutes, let me show you guys how to do that. Let's go ahead and define what a spider is and a cobweb is, okay? A spider is an agreement you've made with a lie, okay? We all have these. So let me say that again. A spider is an agreement you have made with a lie. Everybody watching this has not only one of these, but lots of these. You know, our, our bad behaviors are based on lies we believe. So if a spider is an agreement you've made with a lie, and some of those lies can be, I'm unlovable, um, I'm unworthy, I'm just giving you some, you know, some examples here. Another lie could be uh, my worth is based on what someone else believes. All of these are lies that in turn affect our behavior. But what, what we want to do is we want to like, I don't know, skip the lie part and just work on the medicating behaviors. So if a spider's an agreement you've made with a lie, a cobweb is a medicating behavior that brings false comfort to the lie. There we go. That's where we spend all of our time. Let me say that again. A cobweb is a medicating behavior that brings false comfort to the lie. So that's where we spend all of our time. That's where it's like infomercial land at 2 a.m., P90X, like they're speaking to your cobwebs, right? Like anything that we're medicating, any way that we're medicating, those are the cobwebs, but we spend all of our time in cobweb land. If you walk down the self-help aisle of Barnes & Noble, it's the cobweb aisle. 
Most of those books are just going to help you deal with the behavioral issue. And if you're just cleaning the cobwebs, the spider's hanging out in the corner, waiting to spin those things again. So what are some common cobwebs? I mean, we, we know the ugly cobwebs, right? Alcohol, drugs, pornography, um, gambling. Um, gosh, I mean, you, you think by, by just, this is how you clean the cobwebs of alcohol. Throw the alcohol away. Throw it out the liquor cabinet. Guess what? That's not going to give you freedom at all. Uh, pornography. Um, cleaning the cobwebs would be putting a porn blocker on your phone and giving your password to your spouse or your, or your accountability group. Guess what? That's just cleaning the way, the cobwebs. All you're doing is modifying the behavior. That's never going to give you freedom, right? Uh, th th and right, those are ugly. Those are ugly cobwebs. But let's talk about some pretty cobwebs. How about some of you workaholics? How about you, some of you um, guys and girls that that like you're high achievers, and you believe that your high achievement is validating your worth, and so your your workaholism is suddenly a cobweb. It's a medicating behavior that's bringing comfort to some lie you believe that your worth is based on what other people see in you. You see, working hard isn't bad, but when it becomes a cobweb, a medicating behavior, at that point it is. I will, we'll, even, we'll even go to my wife. My wife is, is uh, she lets me give this example, by the way. Uh, she's an incredible like hostess. Um, she loves to cook and loves to throw parties. Our house looks like Pinterest has vomited on every single wall. She's an incredible incredible decorator, all the things. And I'll never forget when I was writing this book, I, I looked at her and I was like, babe, you don't need this book. This book ain't for you. She's like, no, 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 I've got cobwebs and spiders. And I was like, what do you mean? She said, they may not look as ugly as yours, but you know those parties that I throw every week? They used to be a cobweb. Well, how's that? Because she used to throw the parties believing the lie that she must do to be loved. Therefore, suddenly, parties became a medicating behavior. You guys see, we've all got them. And so it's not hard to find your cobwebs. If you don't know what your cobweb is, just look left or right to your family member or FaceTime somebody. Um, it's kind of weird to have to say that during this quarantine season, but, and ask them, what's my cobweb? They'll tell you. But if you want to find your spider, you can't ask your family. You're going to have to ask Holy Spirit. And I promise you, when you ask, he will tell. So let's get there. What do we do? How do we find our spiders? Well, step one is this. In order to find your spider, you've got to hear from God. And the only way to hear from God, hear from Holy Spirit, is to pay attention. Everybody out there say, pay attention. Okay, let me tell you why. Holy Spirit is speaking to us all the time. All the time, right? Not just like on Sundays or Wednesdays when you're at church, whatever it is. No, 24-7, Holy Spirit, we have access to Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit is speaking constantly. And when we lower the volume of life, I promise you the volume of the Holy Spirit is going to go up. I'll never forget one of the first times uh, that I realized how much Holy Spirit is speaking to us on a daily basis. My wife and I were flying home from Ireland. And uh, I'll never forget, we'd stopped. We were super jet lagged. We're at the Detroit County Airport. Uh, we're exhausted. But you guys know there's a P.F. Chang's, right, in the Delta Terminal at Detroit. And I knew my wife loves P.F. Chang's. So I was like, yo, baby, let's go to P.F. Chang's. She's like, yeah. So while we're at P.F. Chang's, I can see her mood is lightning. I was like, this is awesome. I'm going to tell her a funny story. So I told her this story that I thought was funny about this time I was leading worship and my percussion player forgot his, his egg shaker. You guys know those egg shakers that go chick chick. So we had to run to Guitar Center really fast. Well, at Guitar Center, they were out of egg shakers. So he had to buy a shaker that wasn't an egg. It was actually in the shape of a banana which was a little bit awkward, but whatever. So the whole time I'm leading worship, I'm looking over at my percussion player and he's shaking this banana with his eyes closed, just like this. And I thought it was funny. So I told her, story. what do you think that was funny? That he's shaking the banana? She's like, babe, the banana story is not funny. Words verbatim out of her mouth. Fine. Check, please. Waitress brings a check. On top of every check, wrapped in shrink wrap at every Chinese restaurant you've ever been to is a what? Fortune cookie. Friends, I cracked my fortune open. I pulled the fortune out. I flipped it over and read it, and I stood up freaking out. Oh my gosh. <gasps> and I'm looking for cameras around. She's like, what is wrong with you? My wife's like, why are you freaking out? I spun that around. What word do you think was on my fortune? Some of you said it. Banana. 
the freaking Nana is on my fortune. There's only one word. Listen, I've opened a thousand fortunes in my life. None of them have ever had the fruit of the word I was just talking about. And I'm freaking out. My wife, she sees it. She starts dying laughing. Finally, she's laughing. She thought the Holy Spirit was funny, but not me. And this is what she said. She goes, hey, that's just Carlos. That's just, excuse me, not Carlos. She said, hey, that's just God going, Psst. I said, what do you mean that's just God going, Psst. She's like, that's just God saying, pay attention. You see, friends, we serve a whimsical God. If you're just looking for God to speak in the serious and the mundane, guess what? You'll hear from him, but you're only going to hear half of him. He's speaking in the fun. He's speaking all the time. You just have to pay attention. So step one is to pay attention. You're going to start seeing and hearing from God. Step two is we hear from God when we ask questions. Say, ask questions. Very good. If you didn't say it, I'm judging you. All right, listen. We don't only serve a God that's speaking to us constantly. We serve a God that's speaking to us specifically. We serve a very specific God. We can ask him specific questions. And the specific question today is, what's the agreement I made with the lie? You know, I love to teach about hearing from God um, and, and how God speaks specifically to us. And there's a friend of mine that knew that I loved to, to talk about that. So he asked me to coffee and he's like, Carlos, can you help me hear from God? I don't think I've ever heard from him. I said, sure. So we meet at coffee and I think he thought, he opened his notebook and he had a little pen. I think he thought I was going to tell him like A plus B equals C, this is how you hear from God. But instead I said, no, actually, let's practice right now. You're going to hear from God right now. He's like, excuse me? I said, no, absolutely, you are. He's like, excuse me? You ready? This is what I want you to do. I want you to ask God where you and I should go to lunch. He's like, God's going to tell me where we're supposed to go to lunch right now. I said, yeah. And here's the deal. He didn't want to do it. Oh, why didn't he want to do it? Well, because he didn't want to not hear. That's why so many of us don't ask God specific questions, because we're scared we're not going to hear. But I was so confident in him hearing. So I said, all right, do it. So he closed his eyes like this and he kind of aimed his mouth towards heaven, <laughs> crossed his fingers. And he said, God, where should me and Carlos go to lunch? And then I let him sit there. And about 15 seconds later, he's like, amen. Like maybe like you have to say amen in order for God to hear you. So he was super uncomfortable for a few minutes. And he was, he kept fidgeting around. He kept picking up his phone. Like God's maybe going to text him. And he's like, dude, I don't hear anything. I said, hey, hey, hey. When you prayed that, did you did you sense something? Did you see something? And he's rolling his eyes at me now. Like, what do you mean? I was like, no, seriously. When, when you prayed to God, what did you see? And he didn't want to say it because he didn't want to be wrong. I said, come on, just tell me. And after some prodding, he finally said, well, I saw that Thai restaurant over in Titan Stadium parking lot called Thai Phuket. I said, awesome, let's go. He's like, come on, man. So, so we go, we have a great lunch. We'd actually forgotten that we'd ask God where to go to lunch. Great conversation. Check, please. No fortune cookie ended up on my on my my thing. We're fine. We leave the restaurant. It was fine. And as we're walking out, I'll never forget the most redneck human being I've ever seen in my life. You, I want you to imagine whoever that is in your life right now. Came sprinting out of Thai Phuket. And he's yelling something at us. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe one of us forgot our wallet or something. And he goes up to my friend. He's like, hey, man. Hey, man. Hey, man. You. You. It's like, and he goes, man, you're going to think I'm crazy, man. You're going to think I'm crazy. You're going to think I'm crazy. He's shaking his finger like, you're going to think I'm crazy. And we were both like, yes, that's a fact. We think you're crazy. What? He said, man, you're going to think I'm crazy. Do you sometimes work on your laptop over at that coffee shop called Frothy Monkey? My friend Marcus was like, yeah. He's like, man, you're going to think I'm crazy. But I was in there a couple weeks ago and I was reading my Bible. And you came walking in and I felt like God told me to pray for you. And I'll never forget your face because I told him, no, I was too chicken. And I let you walk out and I never thought I'd see you again. But I was just sipping on my soup in here in Thai food can. And you came walking in here and I was like, oh my God. And my friend Marcus's eyes got this big. And the man goes, can I pray for you? And I got in my minivan and left Marcus in that parking lot with that weird man all by himself. I'll let you know that. But Marcus called me 10 minutes later and he said, God answered my specific question. Friends, we serve a very specific God. And how many of us are missing out on so much because we're not asking him specific questions? So, you get specific, you lower the volume of life. Now what do we do? Because he's going to tell you the spider. He's going to tell you the agreement you made with the lie. It's, you're going to go over this the next few weeks. This is how you kill your spider. You confess the lie, you reject the lie, and you replace the lie with God's truth. 
Confess the lie, reject the lie, replace the lie. Confess the lie, reject the lie, replace the lie. Spiders die. Biggest question people have is how do I know it's dead? That's a great question. And there's some scriptures I believe that tell us how we know when our spider's dead. Scripture, Romans, Romans 8, 6 says this. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. You know, you get peace on the other side of life. John 10, 10. For a thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You know, uh, so many Christians put a period after the word life. Like they think, oh, the whole goal of becoming a Christian is just so you can have eternal life and get to heaven. And although that's a great benefit of becoming a believer fully devoted to Jesus Christ, that's not the goal. Like that's not the whole thing. Guess what? You don't just have to wait for heaven. You can experience fullness and abundance in life here. You don't have to put the period after life. It says life and peace, life to the full. These are things that God has for us here, today, now. J Jesus didn't die on a cross so we can just cope. He died on a cross so you can be free. And I want to give you, just to close, what I believe is a perfect picture of what this life of killing spiders looks like. Like, I, I know I've given you some practical steps, and you guys over the next few weeks are going to dive even deeper into this. And you may be thinking, I don't know if I can hear from God, Carlos. It's going to take some practice. Just like it did for me, uh, a couple of years ago, my family and I were camping in the high Sierras. And I'll never forget the stars this, this first night. There were millions of stars in the sky. It looked like the hundreds of thousands of stars in the sky. And my kids were in the tent. And my wife and I were by the campfire. And I was putting my moves on her, you know. We had our own tent. And so as I'm putting my moves on my wife, I'll never forget. Um, she stops me. And she's like, hey, 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 look at the stars. And I did, and they were beautiful. She said, can you take a picture of the stars? And I was like, baby, buzzkill. So I was like, sure, I'll take a picture. So I went and grabbed her fancy camera. You guys know the fancy cameras with the buttons and the dials and the knobs? Man, I don't know how to use that thing. So I, I grabbed the fancy camera, and I put it in auto mode, right? Because that's, that's the mode that people like me use cameras with. So I put it on auto mode, aimed that puppy at the sky, and took a picture. And let me show you the picture that I got. Okay, so this you're looking right now at the picture of the, the 40 million stars in the sky in auto mode. And here's the deal. I walked over to my wife and I said, hey, how's this picture? She said, uh, I mean, that's that's cute and all, but can you see? There's millions of stars in the sky. I was like, yeah, but I don't know how to do that. She said, but don't you have a friend that does? So now like the romantic moment's officially over and I'm texting my friends in Nashville who are professional photographers and I'm like, how do I get a picture of 30,000 stars? I took a picture and there's only 37 stars. And the, the number one thing my friend said to me is, is the camera in auto mode? I said, well, yeah. He said, oh, bro, you can't capture the abundance of stars in auto mode. It has to be in manual mode. Well, but I don't know how to use manual mode. Sure, you're going to screw up. But listen, this is what you got to do. Take it off of A and put it on the M. Then you have to find the ISO, and you have to crank the ISO from 100 to 12,000. Then you have to find the f-stop, which is all called, also called the aperture, and you have to crank it down from 8.2 to 1.2. Then you have to shutter speed, and you have to slow the shutter speed down from 1 30 of a second to 30 seconds. Then, because the shutter speed is so slow, you got to put it on a tripod, because if you're holding it, then it's going to be shaky. It's going to be blurry, so you got to download a remote on your phone so you can trigger it remotely, and then finally you get a picture. I just want a freaking picture of the stars. Why has it got to be so complicated? Right, and I tried it, and I failed, and I tried it, and I failed. And it was so hard. It took me an hour and a half. But after an hour and a half of doing what my friends said to do, I took a picture. And this was the photo that I got. Friends, let me tell you, this is life to the full. This is life with abundance. This is the photo that God has for you in your life. But so many of us, we'll put the other picture back up, are living life right now in auto mode and we're walking around celebrating life, celebrating the 37 stars of our friends going, look at the 37 stars I've got that God's given me. And God's like, no, I have not given you 37 stars. I've given you 37 million stars when you finally kill the spider. You guys ready to go on this journey? I think you are. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so grateful to be right now in a community of people that are ready to stop just existing and finally start living. Lord, will you please be so clear and loud to those that have not heard you in so long. May today be the day that you begin to be heard by them. 
can they lower the volume of life so the volume of God goes up? And Lord, for those that may know what their spider is right now, will you give them the strength to confess those lies, reject those lies, and replace those lies with your truth? For it's by the blood of the cross and the power of the resurrection that we all said amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Hey, everyone. Wasn't that just the most amazing message? I know I was blessed. I hope you were blessed as well. But I would love for you to join us for what happens next. See, what happens next is our small group time. And the platform that happens on is Zoom. And in that, you're going to be able to connect with people. You're going to be able to share with people. The group is gender specific. So we have male groups and female groups so that it assures a safe environment for each and every person who joins and partners with us. There's a link that is going to scroll down at the bottom of the screen so you can join. But I'm going to share with you that link. That link is crossroadschurch.com slash set free groups. In that, click that link. Once you land on that page, there's a button that says Tuesday night. When you click that, it takes you automatically to the group on Zoom where then you're put into your specific group. So that way, intimate, personal sharing time can take place and you will be, you will be on your journey of healing and on your journey of recovery. But if you're somebody who you're watching, you just completed, finished watching, it's not a Tuesday night. That's okay. I want to encourage you to come back on a Tuesday night, 7 p.m. on our YouTube channel, watch the message live with us, and then at 7.30, join us for the small group time. If it's not a night that is available for you, you just can't make it, that's okay too, or you're somebody that you would like an additional time, we also have a Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. that if you click that on a Saturday morning, you're able to join with us and we have a one-hour group. But in the meantime, I hope you have the most amazing, blessed rest of your week. And I pray that the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, places his hand upon you in such an incredible way that you begin right now experiencing the peace that surpasses all understanding. But in the meantime, I hope you all are blessed. Have a great evening. Good night. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week.